Good morning, Perimeter Church. This is a reading from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is also known as the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing to the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Simon Peter, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the five, so, the 5,000 sat down, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given them thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mike. Let's, uh, let's read aloud together our prayer of illumination. Father, your love is an everlasting love for those who fear you. Keep your covenant and remember to obey your word. Help us submit to your commands. Give us the strength to do your will and draw us into a deeper relationship with you, that we may experience the fullness of your presence and be transformed by your love. Amen and amen. Well, even as we've heard already this morning in the video and as I've even alluded to in that time with Randy and Carol, uh, this church was built on the motto to attempt something so great for God that it's doomed to failure unless God be in it. Attempt something so great for God that it's doomed to fail unless God be in it. This was the charge that Randy received right at the very beginning, uh, even in the, the uh, dreaming stage of planting a church in the Atlanta area. And over the years, it's what we've continued to believe and what we still believe. We, we want to be a church that continues to step out in faith, to trust God for what only he can do truly. In other words, we, we just don't want to, and we've talked about this before, we don't want to just settle for institutional maintenance, but we want to keep pushing towards, by faith, we want to push towards kingdom advancement. You know, one of the temptations that comes with whenever you've had any measure of whatever you want to call it, success, growth, whatever, but where the Lord has added to the number, and he's grown his local body, such that it would be healthy and, and existing unto his glory, uh, the, the temptation is to settle into complacency and just begin to pray prayers and do things that are manageable. And God says, no, 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 I wanna keep calling you out of that temptation into a place of faith. I hope you believe with me that God is still very much doing what he did in the early years, in the mid years, and the, even the more recent years of the life of this church, he's not finished and he's continuing to move and work doing things that only he can do. He is still, he's still resurrecting dead hearts. Um, he is still repairing uh, broken marriages. He's still transforming destroyed lives. He's, he's still rescuing wayward children. He's still building redeemed communities. He's still doing exactly what he said he came to do in 1 John 3, which is to destroy the works of the devil. He's doing it. The question is, do we believe it? And are we trusting individually and corporately that yes, that is the work that you are doing and that we want you to do here. We don't want to just play church. 
We don't want to go through the motions. We don't want to have nice classes that equip us to how to walk in the faith. We don't want to just study theology. We want to trust God for what only he can do. Now, the question we have to ask is this. To what extent have I and have you, have we settled into that temptation of complacency? And here's how that happens. The way that happens is this. It's not overnight. It's gradual over time where we slowly but surely, time and again, assess the various situations of our lives, individually and corporately, together in our own lives and together as a church, and we begin to calculate the odds of something being able to happen, and we attribute to those odds, if you will, our own ability. Can we pull that off? And when we do that, we settle into a place of unbelief outside the bounds of where God is calling us. We're not stepping out in faith because here's the reality. Here's what we're gonna stare in the face this morning in this text, this very familiar passage. Yet again, so many of these stories that John tells are so familiar for those who grew up in or around church, but don't let the familiarity of them breed about complacency because here's what we're gonna look at. We're going to look at a Jesus in this story who is the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever who calls us into a space to trust him as the one who really and truly, genuinely desires to do for us, in us, through us what only he can. And he is more powerful and he is more capable than you and I often believe that he is. And that's the challenge for us to step forward in faith, believing that he is who he says he is and that he does what he says he can do and he is still doing it. That's another temptation we face is we think, well, these are stories of old. God's not really doing those kind of things anymore. But if we look hard enough and we share stories enough, he's still very much in the business of multiplying miracles in our lives. You'll notice that Mike read from John 6. If you were here last week, we were in John 4. And so you go, what happened to John 5? Well, John 5 is important. It's incredibly important. And I hope that you will read and study it on your own. Let me give you a recap, okay? Because there's a lot of really good things in there. Here's what's happening in John 5. It opens up. And John mentions that there's this feast that is happening. We don't know which feast. We don't, he doesn't tell us. If it's the Feast of Booths, you know, we don't know. But... There's a feast happening, and on this feast, all these people are gathered in Jerusalem as they would have been for one of the commemorating feasts that they would do annually every year. And Jesus is there by the pool of Bethesda, where all these lame people lay waiting to hopefully be healed whenever the waters are stirred up. That was the custom. That was the legend, if you will. And he was laying there, and he walks up to this one man, and he he tells him to take up his mat and walk, is the short of it, and this man is healed. Now, the problem is it's on the Sabbath. And those Pharisees, they don't like that because they considered that even healing would be considered work on the Sabbath, and that's against the desire of God. And so Jesus responds and he says, look, I came to do the work, use that word purposefully, of the Father. And that work can be done on the Sabbath. And I didn't come just to do the work of the Father, I came to raise the dead, and I came to bring judgment. And he's looking at them when he says that. Those who are too religious for him. Then after that, he anticipates, is anticipating the charges against him. And so in a sense, almost like in a courtroom environment, he begins to uh, put his witnesses before them. And he, he goes through how John the Baptist and the miracles that Jesus himself is performing and the Father and the scriptures and Moses all point to him. It's all about me, guys. I'm right here in front of your face and you're rejecting me. Now, it's important to understand this. John is not writing in chronological order. He is putting the stories and the events of his gospel account together in a way to where he wants them to build off of each other, but they're not always in sequence. So it might be helpful to know that the events of John chapter 6 with the feeding of the 5,000 and what you have just read or heard summarized for you in John chapter 5 
The events of John chapter six are somewhere most likely between six months to a year after what we read in John five. Uh, Most likely this feeding of the 5,000 takes place in April of AD 29, 29 AD. And these are scholars that have put this timeline together and if they're right, then that's when it's probably taking place, which means that this feeding of the 5,000, this great miracle of Jesus, is happening about exactly a year before he's crucified. So we're well into the ministry of Christ. This three-year ministry, we're at the end of year two of his ministry. It's also interesting to note this before we dive in. Of all the miracles that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record for us of Jesus, outside of the resurrection, this is the only one that's recorded in all four gospels. Which causes us to at some level go, well, I think that this is important. I think think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're wanting us to wrestle with what is this story telling us about Jesus and calling us to believe about Jesus, who he is and what he does. So I'm gonna give you three things for us to chew on as we work our way through the passage. Here's the first one. The response of the disciples reminds us that we, like them, default to limited human reason when faced with overwhelming circumstances. We, like them, default to limited human reason when faced with overwhelming circumstances. Uh, uh, let, me, let me paint the picture for you that we're walking into here in John 6. We can put together, as the story goes, that what is taking place is that Jesus and his disciples are on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. By the way, just so you know, sea back then was used to talk about any large body of water, but the Sea of Galilee is not a saltwater body of water. It's, it's like we you see today. It's, it was a fresh, still is a freshwater lake, but large. And so they're on the northwest side of the lake, probably most likely, we don't know for sure, but in the little fishing village of Magdala, which was where, where Mary was from, not Mary, the mother of Jesus, but Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala. They were probably there and Jesus, Matthew and Mark record for us that Jesus says to his disciples, let's go across the lake to a desolate place, which most likely meant that they went across the northern section of the Sea of Galilee from that northwest side to the northeast side, which even to this day is very desolate. It would have been in what, if you've been to Israel, it would have been in that area that would be called the Golan Heights. And so in that place of desolation, Jesus was looking to get away with his disciples. Now, here's what happens. Jesus has been healing a lot of people. And so a lot of people are following him because they're enamored with his miracles. And so as he sets sail out of perhaps Magdala across that northern section of the Sea of Galilee, all these people see him leaving with his disciples. And what do they do? They walk and probably most likely run, many of them, around the northern rim to try to get to wherever he's going. Now, it's interesting, Matthew and Mark and Luke record that the crowds got there before he got there. John records that Jesus and the disciples actually got there just briefly before the crowds got there. It doesn't matter which way or the other. The bottom line is there was a whole horde of people running around the upper rim, the northern rim of the Sea of Galilee to get to where Jesus is going. And we're talking about a massive amount of people. It says for us, it was 5,000 men. It's been estimated that perhaps it was upwards of 20,000 when you consider women and children. Can you imagine what that must've been like? So he gets to the, the place that they were going, this desolate area on the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee, and it says for us that he looks at the crowd, and as Matthew and Luke record it, he looks at them and he has compassion upon them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. So in other words, he's not annoyed. Because you remember, he's trying to go to a desolate place to get away from the crowds because they're just so encroaching upon him and the disciples. And so he says, let's go over there. And they get there and the crowds are there. Jesus doesn't go, you gotta be kidding me. He looks upon them and he has compassion upon them. 
as John continues his account of it, it says a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing. It says this, Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now verse five says this, it says, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip. Now John gives us something here that the other gospel writers don't give us. The other gospel writers just say disciples, that Jesus asked his disciples. But John typically often gives a little more detail than the other ones when he gives his accounts, perhaps because no one was closer to Jesus than John. John was Jesus' best friend during his time on, on earth in this ministry, these three years of ministry. And so John specifies for us that he turns to Philip. Now, we don't know why he turns to Philip. Maybe it was as simple as that Philip was the closest disciple to him when he asked the question. Maybe it was because Philip was from that specific area of the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee and was most familiar with all the little villages around there. We don't know why he turns to Philip, but he turns to Philip and he asks him this question. He says, where are we to buy bread so that these people may Eat. They've been walking or running for miles for a better part of the day. And then once they get there, it's near nighttime and the, the sun, sunset is coming. And Jesus says, how are we going to feed these people? Now, it tells us clearly, verse 6, he said this to test him, Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus knows what's going to happen. He wants to see if Philip knows. Here's Philip's reply. Okay, remember the first point, right? We tend to default to human reason when presented with overwhelm, overwhelming circumstances. This is what Philip, Philip says. He says, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little, to get, maybe, maybe even the in, in, implication is to even get a bite. 200 denarii, by the way, a denarii is, is a day's wage, a common day's wage. So what he's saying is this, for 200 days wages, for two thirds of your annual paycheck, that wouldn't be enough to feed this many people enough to just get even a bite or two. In other words, so much doubt. And so, Andrew steps in. You think maybe Andrew's stepping in to say, Philip, come on, man. We know what Jesus can do. So Andrew steps in, says, verse eight, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Like that sentence gets almost through and you go, okay, I think Andrew's getting it. I think, I think he's understanding what's, what's happening here. There, there is a boy here, Jesus, he has five barley loaves and two fish. Do your thing, Jesus. Right? You think that might be where it's going. By the way, don't think, side note, when you hear loaves, don't think like what we have, like Wonder Bread loaves, okay? Don't think that. These are, these are flat, almost pancake, but not sweet, uh, flat little pieces of bread, right? That, uh, that don't, so when you hear loaves, that's misleading in the English. But you think Andrew's getting there. And then he says, but what is that for so many? He's doubtful. He's using human logic. He's, he's calculating the odds and he's going, I, what do we do here? Now, consider this. Consider what John has already recorded for us to this point in his gospel. Now remember, it's not chronological, but already he's recorded for us in John chapter two, the incredible miracle of turning water into wine, an enormous amount of water into wine, and not just wine, but the best wine that people have ever drunk in their lives. Okay, so he's John two on that one, right? Then we've just read in John chapter five, you just heard me talk about that he's healed this man on the Sabbath at the pool of Bethesda. They, they've seen him do extraordinary things, but, but listen, consider this. What had they seen him do that day. Look, look at what Matthew, John doesn't record this, but look what Matthew and Luke record for us about that day. It says this, when the crowds learned it, meaning that he was going across the sea, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God. And watch this, and cured, healed those who needed healing. 
This is the way Matthew says it. He says, when, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. I mean, think about this. Don't you know that there's got to be a part of Jesus that's going, dude, what? you've been here, right? Like, not just with me for these two years, but today. You, you, you remember that, we, that we, we came across the sea, there was this big, huge a mass of people, and I've spent the last, I don't know how many hours speaking to them about the kingdom of God and healing hundreds, of, if not thousands of them. You think I can't feed them? Where, where's your faith, boys? You know, there, there's, if, if I were Jesus, clearly I'm not, it, it would be as if he would just like, are you serious right now? Really? You think this is a challenge for me? You think that I can't feed these people? I'm testing you, boys. And they're going, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, there's a lot of people. I don't I mean, it's like, man, what have you seen me do for two years? I mean, I could take rocks right here and turn them into bread if I wanted to. Do you not know who I am? After all this time. But they didn't believe in the moment. There was no faith. Human logic, calculating the odds. I don't know how we can pull this off. Here's, here's where we need to sit for a second. What are you currently believing God for that only he can pull off? What are you, what are you trusting him for that only he can do? If your prayers, if, if your places of trust are ultimately in things that you might could pull off, that's not faith. Are, are we praying big? Are we looking at the five loaves of bread and two fish in our lives and going, Lord, I don't, I don't know how you could do anything with this, but I know you can and I know you will, and it may not be the way that I think it's gonna happen, but I just know this. You love me, you're for me, and you provide extravagantly for your people. That's the second thing we need to sit with. The response of Jesus reminds us, notice this, the response of Jesus reminds us that he, unlike us, defaults to extravagant generosity in meeting the needs of his people. Jesus is the extravagant giver. <laughs> I mean, again, you, you would think this would be a moment after what's recorded for us in verse nine where he would just kind of sarcastically rebuke these disciples. Like, guys, come on, but he doesn't. I mean, maybe he gave them a side eye. <laughs> Serious? But watch what he does in verse 10. He says, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in this place early in the spring, green grass all along this hillside. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Again, we don't know women and children, how many more that might have been. Jesus then took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, perhaps some foreshadowing to the next year's Passover meal. When he had given thanks, he broke the bread. He said, this is my body. He distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. You know, it was common in this day and time in these poor fishing villages that would have been around the northern rim of the Sea of Galilee, it was common for people to never get full. They only ate enough to just make it. And it was almost whatever they caught in this you know, sometimes bread. But it wasn't common for these people, these North Galilean people, to get full. Jesus is right there in the front of the face of his disciples saying, I'm not just going to feed them. I'm going to feed them to the full as much as they wanted. When Jesus decides to give, 
He gives and he gives and he gives, so much so that it's even beyond what we thought we needed. You know, listen, quick caveat. Here's what this isn't teaching, and this is not what the, here's what the Bible is not teaching. The Bible is not teaching that if you have enough faith, you'll get whatever you want. The Bible doesn't teach that. Jesus didn't teach that. It's not that if you have enough faith, you get whatever you want, but it is this. It is that this Savior who is so good and so extravagantly generous gives you abundantly what we need even beyond what we think we need. And then watch this. He doesn't just give, he gathers. Nothing, nothing goes to waste. Did did you catch it? Because Jesus says to him in verse 12, and when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. I mean, these aren't just little crumbs that they go around and scoop up. These are, these are big chunks of fish and bread that are left over because these people, thousands of people have eaten their full so much that they say, I can't eat another bite. <laughs> he, is so, he is so filled my hunger, my longings, I just, this is unbelievable. I've never had a meal. Some of the people there would say this, I've never had a meal where I've eaten this much. <laughs> no more. And Jesus says, fellas, go, go, go pick up what's left behind. And we don't know what they did with it. Maybe they took it into one of the villages and gave it to those who had not come out and who were hungry, we don't know, but he just says, look, so it won't be lost, so that it won't go to waste. And I think there is a proper application to this, to say this, that Jesus gives and he gives and he gives and he gives generously such that oftentimes it's not even what we ask for, or it's different from what we ask for, and sometimes it is what we ask for, but the bottom line is he gives, but he also gathers. The way Job says it is this, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away, may the name of the Lord be praised. In other words, there are moments in our life where he gives and he gives abundantly, and there are moments in our life where he gathers and we go, is this not waste? You think about it. For many of us, our stories are not what we thought they would be. He gives a pregnancy and it ends in miscarriage. He gives a marriage and it ends in divorce or the loss of a spouse to death. He gives a job, the dream job that we always wanted and it ends in termination. He gives a body, (laughs) but it's riddled with disease. He gives and he gathers and you go, is this part over here that's left over, is it not waste? And the tender Jesus of the hillside of the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee stoops down into our faces and he says, nothing goes to waste. Nothing. Every tear you cry, I bottle them up and I feel the ache with you in every tear and I I let them cover the book that I hold for you that writes your story and I'm in it with you and it's in the anguish of the gathering seasons of your life where you actually find me to be the one who satisfies you most. Not what I give you, but me. You know, there's seasons in our life where you hear a point like this one where you go, Jesus is the extravagant giver, and you go, okay, show me. I don't know that I've seen him be this extravagant giver. I don't, I don't know that I've seen him multiply loaves and fish into my life, as it were. I, where, where is this extravagant giving Jesus? And this is what he does in his faithfulness and his kindness towards us, he gently and compassionately, remember he looks upon the crowds with compassion, he lifts our eyes to gaze where? At the cross. Because the ultimate display of the generosity of Jesus is in his giving 
of himself where he gave and he gave and he gave and he gave and he gave to the end of his own life so that you and I may have abundant life and eternal life. So when we think in these seasons of gathering that there's waste and where's the generosity of God, he turns our hearts to the cross to say time and time again, my generosity knows no bounds. But look at this third thing that we need to observe. The response of the masses, this huge crowd, reminds us that we, like them, can fall prey to following Christ for wrong and selfish reasons. Why were they following Jesus? What did they want from him? I mean, it tells us here towards the end of the passage in, in verse 14, it says this, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. They're referring back to Deuteronomy 18. This ancient text that was written by Moses that said there's one coming, there's this prophet that's coming and he had some language around this prophet and they recognized rightfully this is him. He's the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. Great, so far so good. Then verse 15, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. In other words, you're not making me king. They wanted to make him king, which is not a bad thing necessarily. They're seeing, hey, this, I think this is the prophet that's been promised, the Messiah, the Savior to come. This, I think he's here. Let's go make him king. But why did they want to make him king? Well, they wanted the prophet of their desires, not the prophet that Jesus came to be. They wanted the Savior of their desires, not the Savior that Jesus came to be. In other words, they wanted the one who would fill their bellies and who would conquer their enemies. Not the enemy you're thinking of. Not the devil. Rome. They wanted to make him king so that they could parade him to Rome to overcome their oppressors because they thought that was their biggest need. So Jesus withdraws. He withdraws from the crowd and he goes up on the mountain. Now, when you hear mountain, don't think Rocky Mountains. Don't even think Appalachian Mountains, okay? Think pretty big hill in Atlanta, okay? Because if you've been to Israel, you know these aren't mountains like we might think of mountains here. But he goes up to a higher ground to get alone with the Father, to be reoriented. Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully human. So don't you know he felt the temptation to go with them in that moment? You know the human temptation to be made much of? There, there was probably something in that tempting part of Jesus that would be like, eh, this is pretty enticing. I could be their king in this way. But no, no, no. He, he went back to the Father to say, Father, your will, not my will be done. I came to be the king they need, not the king they want. So it begs us the question, how, how are we the same? How do you run to Jesus because of what Jesus could potentially give you, not because you want Jesus? He's, an ends to a, he's a means to an end, not an end in and of himself. You know, John Piper famously wrote, God is the gospel. The good news of the gospel is not necessarily, although it is, I mean, don't mishear me. It's beautiful and awesome, and we will sing for all of eternity about the realities that we are forgiven of all of our sin through the gospel and that we are declared righteous and accepted as right and pure and holy in the presence of God because of Jesus' work on our behalf. But don't be mistaken, the great, grand treasure of the gospel is that we get him. Not for what he gives us necessarily, but that this God whom we offended in the garden, when we fell dead in the garden with our first parents, that he's now resurrected us into right relationship with him, that we get God. That's the point of the gospel. And so very often we fall into this mindset that, that we want the giver more, we want the gifts more than we want the giver. 
What can you give me? And if you don't give me what I want, then are you worth worshiping? And Jesus says, in this story and all throughout the pages of the Bible, I have always, always, always given you what you need. More than you know. So, where does this leave us? Well, there's a verse I didn't read on purpose, and it's probably the most important verse of the whole passage. And it's verse 4, and it's going to look like nothing to you. Here it is. Verse 4 says this, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Why might that be the most important? Because think about it. Let's connect some dots. John is hoping that those who have ears to hear and eyes to see are connecting some dots with the whole biblical narrative. Because what is the Passover? The Passover is that thing that their ancestors have been celebrating for well over a thousand years to commemorate and celebrate the uh, the exodus, that when God led his people out of slavery to Egypt into the promised land over time. And with that, he, he did many miracles to lead them into that new place. The two most prominent being that he split the Red Sea so that they would walk across on dry land and he provided for them for 40 years in the wilderness with manna, bread from heaven as it were. What Jesus is doing in this story? Where did they go again? Uh, They went across the northern part of the sea to where? To the desolate wilderness. And what happened in the Exodus, uh, God gave manna from heaven to provide for his people. What is Jesus doing? He's multiplying manna, as it were, as the bread from heaven, the one who has come. What what was it that, that they did back in the Exodus? Well, back in the Exodus, they walked across dry land. If we keep reading in this story, the very next story is that they go back across, but Jesus walks on water as if to say, I'm going to walk on the sea as though it were dry land so that just as you marveled at God back there in the Exodus, you will marvel all the more at the one who has come in the name of God. What did Moses do? Moses left his people to go up on the Mount Sinai to meet alone with God. What did Jesus do? He left the masses. He left the people to go up upon the mountain to meet alone with the Father. What is Jesus doing in this story? He is reenacting the exodus before his people. Why? To say this, for those who have ears to hear, I am the true and better Moses. And I am ushering in a true and better Moses. Exodus, not one that, not one that is delivery, deliverance from slavery to Egypt, but one that is deliverance from slavery to sin and death and hell. If you marveled at that, will you marvel all the more at me? Oh God, would you help us? Would you help us to marvel at King Jesus? Not the king that we want, but the king that we need, who gives us all that we could ever long for, who fills not just our bellies, but fills our hearts, who satisfies us not just now, but for all of eternity. Oh God, would you do that good work in us such that, yes, we would trust you for what only you can do because we know who you are. We know what you're capable of. Stretch our faith. Help us to believe in this great Jesus whom we sing to now for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to the Perimeter Church Sermon Podcast. Perimeter Church is located at the corner of Highway 141 and Old Alabama Road in Johns Creek, Georgia. Please visit our website at www.perimeter.org for more information, to give us your feedback, and to find other sermons from our teaching team. Thanks for making this podcast a part of your day.